Welcome back, everybody, from break. We are going to start our panel discussion presented by SAGE. SAGE stands for Sociocultural Applications for Global Enterprise. SAGE is an IWP student-run organization. Um, all of our SAGE members will be graduating this weekend. Um, it's a group that researches and studies the connection between US foreign policy and sociocultural elements of the areas in which the policy is enacted. Uh, Alexander Cunningham leads SAGE. He will be graduating with a master's degree in strategic intelligence studies and was recently hired by At Risk International, a security firm in Virginia. And Alex is gonna introduce the rest of the team to you. Hello, well, a little bit more on SAGE really quick. Uh, it kind of began with like a common interest that we all had amongst each other and a lot of intellectual slash fun conversations down in the IWP library. Um, from uh, right to left here, Ty, she's a, a fellow strategic intelligence studies uh, major. And then we have Nathan Fiala, who's a uh, national security, and then Austin Reddick, who's also national security. And all of them like bring something unique to the table. We all have common interests, yet kind of our own perspectives and own experiences that when combined, you know, we really came up with something pretty cool in our paper. So I think it's pretty awesome and I'm really excited that we actually get to present our group work here. So yeah, I guess Ty, uh, she's got to talk about the Jazeera and State. And, uh, here you go. So the, over, uh, the title of our combined paper is The Greater Syria Mesopotamia Crisis. So I, get, I guess you can pretty much tell that we're going to be talking about this area that's highlighted in the map. Mm -hmm. My research really focused on the area in which the current um, ISIS group is controlling, um, which historians and anthropologists normally refer to as Jazeera. It's a predominantly Arab-speaking Sunni Muslim area and it's got a history of autonomy and it's generally been isolated through, mo through most of its history. And as you can see the maps are very similar. Mm -hmm. This image taken um, through ISIS or the Islamic State's Twitter account in 2014 really incited a debate about what these borders, what the border between Iraq and Syria really means. Um, is it an arbitrary man-made border or is it a true historical cultural marker? This is actually the picture of them tearing down the border and declaring their state that runs between Iraq and Syria. And so I decided to do a little bit of um, historical digging. Generally, um, the reason why I found this topic really was because I was researching foreign fighters and it seemed that there was a a large amount of foreign fighters crossing over the Syria-Iraq border um, to go join Al-Qaeda, which was Al-Qaeda in Iraq back then, but is now ISIS. And they were crossing, they were going through Dar Azor, which was a transit city for them, and then arriving in, in Al-Bukhmal, so got this nice little thing here, um, which is right there, and then they would cross over on foot to Al-Qaeda. Now, usually when you have these sort of pervious borders, um, Sometimes, and of course the smuggling culture as well, you have similarities shared. Um, and of course I found also that al Bukamal and Al-Qaim were considered one family divided by a border. So going back to the Ottoman Empire before pre-1918, uh, there was the administrative division or what was called a vilayet um, called Aleppo and then there was the vilayet of Baghdad. Well, Dar Azur was right in the middle. It was, neither, it was not a vilayet, it was a sanjak, which is more of a subdivision. And in most maps you'll find it. It'll be Dar Azur or Azur. Mm -hmm. And during the Sykes-Picot Agreement um, in 1918, the French and the British, neither of them really knew what to do with Dar Azur. It was out in the middle of a desert. It did run along the Euphrates. Um, but they considered it a no man's land between Syria and Mesopotamia, which were the places they actually wanted to have influence over. So when they drew the border, it was really more of an arbitrary line. So the French took a area which they influenced and then an area which they controlled, which is the A zone is the influence area. And then the B zone is the British influence zone. 
And as you can see, it's not, it's not really a, it wasn't really a defined line to them. They still didn't exactly know where the border really was. And of course, the border happened to be drawn between Dar al Zor and Abu Kamal. This did not make Dar al Zor very happy. So the city of Dar al Zor, they decided they was, it was probably the most predominant city in that area at the time. They decided they were going to side with the Aleppo revolt, the Arab revolt that was happening in Aleppo, Syria. Well, the tribal leaders didn't get along very well. So this only lasted for maybe a couple of months, and then they decided to annex themselves to British Iraq, British-influenced Iraq. They didn't get along with the British either. So they decided again, you know what, we're just going to side with the Arab revolt. We want our own state. We want to rule ourselves. So there was a lot of violence. There was a lot of violence that happened. There were many battles. Um, and so British decided to end the violence. They would give Dar al Zor access to Al Bukamal. But this was only supposed to be a temporary border. This was a temporary border so that the violence would end. About a month later, Fr the French decided to take full control of Syria, and the borders haven't changed since. Mm -hmm. And of course, this, these photos I found from uh, 1942, uh, in this really random blog. This is Dar al Zor. And what the British and the French refer to as a no man's land, it's actually very populated. There was a lot of things happening there. Um, again, it was very rich with the culture of the Arabic-speaking Sunni Muslims. And also, interesting, interestingly enough, this region that Dar al-Zor was within is known as the Sunni Triangle during the US um, invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. And just for a bigger picture of Jazeera, um, it's also referred to as Upper Mesopotamia, the Mid-Fertile Crescent. But Jazeera is probably the most accurate term because it really means in Arabic a peninsula or an island, and in this case, it's a land between two rivers. As you can see, if I can get it, this is the Euphrates, and then this is the Tigris. So this whole area, generally isolated from the other areas, and to the north of this area, you have most of the Kurdish region. To the south, you have the Shia region. And then over here, you have a very diverse population on the coast, and then of course, just desert. So these people really were isolated. And so, Going uh, forward to the Iraq, uh, the invasion of Iraq by U.S. coalition, most of you might have heard of the Ambar Awakening or the Sons of Iraq. They originally, some of these people were housing Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda in Iraq, and they decided instead because Al Qaeda was killing their own people, they were just being very ruthless. Um, they decided to support the U.S. to root out Al Qaeda. So this is kind of, um, to me, it seems very similar to what happened when they were trying to figure out whether or not to decide with the Arab revolt or with the colonists. And this area actually was in traditional Jazeera. Um, that's the Al Ambar region. Of course, the Ambar awakening did spread eventually to the rest of Iraq, but it began here. And again, this is the Euphrates, and this is Dar al Zor. Um, Abu Kamal is here and Al Qaim is here. So this area just has some very interesting things mm -hmm. happening. And of course, the present day. Again, we have ancient Jazeera and we have Al Qaeda um, or Al Qaeda in Iraq, which is now the Islamic State. And what's very interesting about this map is that these brown areas are the places in which ISIS controls very recently as of April uh, 2015. And then the orange areas are the places that it's lost control of since 2014. This really shows where they're gaining the most support is in the traditional Jazeera. And I think that means a lot for where it's going, where their loyalties really lie. Um, so that's pretty much all I have for right now. And I guess I'll pass this on to Austin's research. Oops. Mm -hmm. All right, so I wrote a short bit of our paper um, on environmental and economic factors as they affect people in the region, specifically Syria, the refugee crisis uh, that's come about as a result of the Syrian civil war, um, and then how it's spread into Iraq, not only with the drive of ISIS into Iraq last summer, um, but also with Iraq's internal, internally displaced persons um, and then the subsequent refugee outflow from Syria into Iraq as well. Um, so. mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
by the way. Yep, so um, here's the region. Uh, you guys are probably pretty familiar with it at this point. Um, this is um, the distribution of agricultural land uh, from the Department of Agriculture here in the US. Um, and I, as you can see, a vast amount of the Middle East is not arable. Um, not only that, um, a lot of the arable land is being uh, degraded every day. Um, so um, you've got Israel, or sorry, Syria here, Iraq here, um, and you can see more than half of the land on, for both nations is a desert land. You can't grow anything on it. It's completely salinated in the soil. Um, and so people in this region find a very hard time getting food. Um, a lot of it ends up being imported. The Syrian government for a very long time uh, as a socialist regime um, has subsidized very heavily the agricultural sector, um, also fuel distribution and things of that nature. With the war, the government's not able to do that. And so even the land that was arable now, it's, it, it's really not a good situation um, overall. And so food security issues are a huge factor in the current conflict. Um, 25% yeah, of the land was arable. Uh, it's less than that now. Um, and the sort of the run up to the Syrian civil war, pre Arab Spring days, um, 2006 to 2011, um, and it, there's some evidence that it's still ongoing. Um, there's a very severe drought in Syria. Farmers and farming communities disappeared. They fled to urban areas because of the global economic crisis, somewhat. Um, also government incompetence um, on the part of the Syrian regime. People cannot get jobs in urban areas. So you have this sort of perfect storm of environmental and economic issues that drive people to start protesting, in part because of no jobs, no food, no security. Um, not only that, but it's not even that men could just leave and go for work in the cities. In Arab culture, particularly in rural Arab culture, you don't leave your families behind, they go with you. So you have a very big wave of people going into urban centers in Syria, and there's no jobs, no food. Water is um, an issue. Um, so, and then you have the Arab Spring. Syria becomes, um, I, I don't know the official date for when the war exactly started, but um, it, it, it came about after the Egyptian crisis, which I'm sure many of you are also aware of. So this, this is again uh, Department of Agricultural Maps showing the rainfall in Syria. And you can see here, I don't know, for those of you in the back that might not be able to read it, uh, the map on the right shows uh, September 06 to April 2007. Um, the yellow regions, uh, it's 75% of normal rainfall, the brown, dark brown is less than 50%, or 50% or less than normal rainfall. A year later, almost the entire country is 50% or less in terms of the normal rainfall that they would expect to get. Um, so you can imagine what this does to an economy, to water resources, farming, food security, and so on and so forth. Um, again, um, some of the best maps I found were the Department of Agriculture maps. So um, the red line on the map on the right, don't pay too much attention to it, but it's just dividing the country north and south. Um, but it shows the distribution of agricultural land again. Um, I would like to point out that um, in this area here, this is Damascus, the capital city. Um, so there's some arable land here. Um, most of it was up in the north. Um, and then in this middle region, which Ty explained to you all, is Jazeera, there's not much at all. And if you remember from the previous map, they ran out of rainwater for the most part um, in 2007 to 2008. Um, so another factor, Islamic State. Um, traditionally in Arab societies, um, there was this sort of agreement um, that rulers would to some degree take ownership of the people under their control and provide some services. Um, it's known as a bread compact, bread being the most staple um, food supply for Middle Eastern peoples. Um, this is traditional, historical, 
not explicitly religious, um, but it means something to people. So ISIS, under the regions that they control, they at least advertise, I don't know how it works in practice, that they will provide free bread to the people under their control. Uh, they have hospitals, police, courts, um, electricity and water distribution. Um, they're either building or rebuilding, fixing uh, telecommunication systems. Um, many of you have probably read um, that they've pointedly attacked and then tried to reestablish oil distribution and even selling oil. Some of the oils actually, in fact, were sold into through Turkey. Some of the Kurdish uh, groups um, have bought some of it. Um, so it does end up actually on the open market in some, some cases, and they do collect a lot of money from that. Um, so one of the most important factors, though, under ISIS, for better or worse, they do have the rule of law. Um, so for people who might have been suffering for years, starving, families are displaced, whether they like it or not, at least there's rules, and they can go somewhere to, if they have a grievance, they can go lodge a complaint in the courts. Um, so for some people, under these circumstances, that is more stable than the alternative. This is an advertisement um, on Twitter from the Wilayat Halab. Uh, that's the state of Halab uh, under the Islamic State. It's an administrative division, or Wilayat, which Ty mentioned. Um, this is just advertising that um, they're good stewards of the environment. Um, they'll raise crops, uh, provide water, um, so on and so forth. This is um, another picture from the same Twitter account of ISIS actually either building or repairing a telecommunications tower. I don't know if it's a cell tower. Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, but anyway, they're, they're advertising this quite openly. This is the under, you know, here you can see this is the official Wilayat Halab Twitter account page. This is a bread distribution center. Um, so, you know, it looks fairly modern. Um, when they've taken over um, any areas in Syria, they, they reuse everything that's there. Nothing goes to waste for the most part. Um, and so this is a way um, to get the buy-in from people living under them and say, hey, this is an Islamic state. This is an Islamic system. This is the way we're going to run things, and we're going to take care of the people here. Um, so going on to Iraq, the refugee crisis, um, they have three and a half million internally displaced persons, two and a half million added in 2014 alone out of that three and a half million. 46% of those, um, plus another 250,000 others uh, fled into the Kurdish region in Iraq. Um, they did that because it's close in proximity first, and second of all, it's the safest area to go. Um, there's still food shortages, water, all of the same shortages that I've mentioned um, still remain. Um, whatever the international efforts have been, people are still dying from this. Um, and so it, it becomes a problem for policymakers, which is um, what Sage is most interested in, um, in the fact that if these people are disillusioned enough in refugee camps, it could spark another crisis within a crisis. It can happen. It has happened in the past in other cases. Um, there have been revolts in the 70s in Jordan by Palestinian refugees that actually led to the capital being taken over. Um, and the government actually pulled out. It was a really big sort of fiasco for a few weeks. Um, and the government cracked down. You don't want to see this in a refugee camp in Iraq or Jordan today. I don't think it would go down quite as well, um, partly because um, there's more international players involved in this. You have ISIS. You have other um, rebel groups in Syria. Um, it, it just makes for a much more complex situation. Um, and then the other bit of this is that you're really in a bad situation if you're a refugee and you have to go to Iraq. Um, the government really is hard pressed to take care of many of its own today. Um, just to put that in a little bit of perspective, um, in Jordan, um, in 2011, the nation of Jordan didn't have enough medical personnel, supplies, or facilities to actually take care of its own people. Then they have an influx of upwards of a million refugees. Um, Iraq wasn't even that well off as a nation. So it, it's a very critical situation. Just because it's not up in the news anymore, it's still a pretty dire, um, dire set of events. 
Um, last bit here, um, this is Atari camp in northern Jordan. It's five miles south, five kilometers south of the Syrian border. Um, very, still, still very much exposed to danger. This image was, uh, it says CNN here, it's from the New York Post. Um, this is only sort of a, a corner shot, if you will, of the actual camp. Um, there's 83,000 estimated by the UN as of May of this year. Um, at the height of the population of the camp, it was uh, 118,000. Um, and most of you can probably see there's little shacks and whatnot. They're not permanent structures, they're tents. Um, so these people have been living here for years, for most of them. Um, it's not entirely clear what the security situation is. The Jordanians do control a bit of it. Um, they've bombed trucks and um, other vehicles um, once or twice uh, north of here, a, f a few kilometers along the border that they thought were trying to penetrate um, within the last year, trying to penetrate uh, the border uh, from Syria. They didn't know what they were. Um, it's not clear whether um, there's any recruiting going on for groups such as Jabhat al-Nusra or ISIS or any other such groups or even the Assad regime itself. Um, so the other bit of this is talking about economic and environmental factors. This is a refugee camp. Everything these people have has to be imported. Um, I'm not up here trying to give a, a, get donations for this, to these people, but it is a critical issue in terms of U.S. national security, in terms of the security of the state of Jordan, um, in terms of the overall security of Syria with respect to how they might be able to rebuild if and when hostilities do end. Um, it's, it's really not uh, a pleasant picture, as you can imagine. So, um, yeah, that's about it. So, the environmental uh, conditions and economic factors are a huge part of this conflict, and they don't need to be overlooked. All righty. Doing all right back there? Back standing up? The knees not buckled? Okay. All right, my name is Nate Fial, and I'll be presenting my research on Iraqi youth fights for Iran in Iran's empire. So far, uh, what we've heard is that uh, the Sunni about we've heard about the Sunni Arabs in Jazeera, and how ISIS has manipulated that area to their advantage. We've also heard about how um, the environment has been one factor that led to conflict in Syria, and also how ISIS has used that to manipulate the situation, um, and how it has affected uh, the people living in that area. What I will actually be talking about uh, is Iran. So we're going from the western part to the east. Uh, my research examines uh, how Iran's middle, or my research examines Iran Middle Eastern strategy, how it affects uh, and is playing out in Iraq, and how it's affecting the Iraqi people. Uh, this presentation I will focus actually on one particular Iraqi Shia Arab. He's a member of a group known as Hashid al Shabi. Um, and I'm actually kind of using him as a symbol, as a concrete flesh and blood example or representative of Iran's interests in Iraq. I argue in my research, and I have been uh, arguing this for about two years now, um, that it would behoove American policymakers to understand this individual and to understand the, the Iraqi youth, the Iraqi Shia Arab in the streets of Baghdad and Najaf, um, because they are the center of gravity. Uh, much like the U.S. cannot defeat ISIS until we understand the Sunni tribal leaders in the Jazeera area, uh, we cannot hope to counter Iranian influence in the regime until we know and understand the Shia Arabs in the streets of Baghdad. Um, okay. This is, uh, I like to call this man right here Agent A, mostly because I do not know his real name. Um, but Agent A, we don't actually, we don't know what he's thinking. We don't know what he does on a day-to-day -day basis, but we do and we can read the messages that he's very clearly sending to us. This picture alone gives us multiple indications of how this man views the world and how he views himself and us. Uh, first of all, um, this, this picture is actually taken at a pro-Shia protest. Uh, it's actually, the protest has nothing to do with Iran or Iraq. They're protesting about the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Um, it was taken uh, March 31st, 2015, so that's recently. Uh, what is he, look at what he's wearing. He's wearing tactical gear from head to toe. 
he's showing us that he's a warrior. He's not willing to lay down his arms. He's not willing to let his people um, be invaded and brutalized anymore. He's very much showing that he's going to fight for what he has for his family. Um, he's holding a picture. Where's the power or the thing? Oh. Um, so in this picture, we have two very interesting, very important people in the, in the Shia culture. Um, one we have here is Supreme Leader Ayatollah uh, Khamenei, and right here we have the Grand Ayatollah al-Sistani. Um, the reason that they're, that they're both of them is, is interesting by itself. These are two power centers, struggling power centers, and they have been power centers within the Shia culture for a long time. The Supreme Leader is uh, the head of state of Iran. And um, Ayatollah Sistani is the Grand Ayatollah uh, in Najaf in Iraq. The head of state, Supreme Leader uh, Khamenei, claims to have religious authority. Whereas um, the Grand Ayatollah, he's 84 years old right now, he's the son of a Grand Ayatollah. He has been training in religious jurisprudence literally his entire life. He is considered the most legitimate uh, religious leader in the region. Um, and the Supreme Leader believes in clerical jurisprudence. That is uh, the concept that the clergy should have day-to-day -day control over politics, pretty much a theology, or not theology, um, theocracy. Um, while, whereas the Grand Ayatollah believes in the traditional Shia concept known as quietism. This is the concept that the clergy stays out of day-to-day -day politics in order to kind of lead the Ummah, or greater Shia um, people to purify themselves so that once they have purified themselves then the Mahadi will return. Whereas the Grand I or um, the Supreme Leader says that the state, the state of Iran must purify the caliphate. It's an active virtue, it's an active virtue is more of a passive, res uh, passive stance. And um, also when we look at Agent A when you look at his eyes, or what the part of his face that you can actually see, um, we can guesstimate that he's roughly around 25 years old. Which means that for the, since he was 10 years old, so for the past 15 years, he's known nothing but war. Here's a man that is willing to fight, is telling us that he believes in certain ideologies, and is saying that this is all he's trained for for the last 15 years. This is it. Look at his body language. His fist is clenched in a ball of anger. His eyes so show nothing but disdain. This right here is why I say that he is the center of gravity. This is the person that we need to know. Um, we'll get to him. What is Iran's political end goals in the region? And why do I say that, that we need to know both Iran's political end goals, their strategy, as well as uh, the Iraqi share of in, in the streets. Um, my thesis for the last two years has pretty much been that uh, it is Iranian political end goal, of, or it's the political end goal for the radical far right elements within Iran's clergy, the national security apparatus, and the political class to establish the Iranian, uh, Iranian regional hegemon, or the Shah and Shah, in order to reestablish the Shia Iranian caliphate which will pave the way for the return of the Ma'adi, which is the 12th Imam. Uh, the ideological motivation behind this is the combination of Iranian exceptionalism, Shia revolutionary, and realpolitik. Now, you don't have to believe me. Um, I'm a 25-year-old living in DC. We could listen to Ali uh, Yunisi, who is the former head of Iranian Ministry of Intelligence Security. MOIS. For those of you that don't know about MOIS, they are famous for kidnapping, torturing, and murdering journalists, um, innocent people, as well as just <coughs> folks that they don't agree with. Um, he, in a recent interview, said that since its inception, Iran has always had a global dimension. It was born an empire. He goes, in on that, he goes further in that interview to talk about the concept of greater Iran, saying that Greater Iran, its borders include all territory that has existed to Iran dating back to the Persian Empire. For those of you that haven't read Herodotus' history, if we 
get that going. There you go. This is um, the Persian Empire uh, during the time of, of the attack on Greece. Now, we also know that the concept of greater Iran extends down into here and up through here. And uh, due to recent activity, for those of you who've been following along in the news, down into Yemen now. They now believe that Yemen is part of, of greater Iran. Um, <coughs> how are they going to do it? This actually is a map of, of Iranian um, regional operations. We have obviously their nuclear or potential nuclear capabilities that they're trying to develop right now. But what I actually focus on is their covert operation, or what was once covert is now very much overt operations, um, into Iraq, in Syria, and Lebanon. And then now currently into Yemen. Um, how are they doing this? Well, they're doing it through uh, an organization known as Quds Force. It's a section of the IRGC. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. Right, and uh, this is General Qasim Soleimani. He's the commander of IRGC QF, uh, which is Quds Force. He's been um, conducting covert operations, specifically in Iraq, against the United States soldiers since 2003. He's been conducting covert operations in general in the region long before that. I, this man right here, um, quite possibly be the most dangerous man in the Middle East. Now, as me and my teammates also like to think, he, uh, because of his unique look to the Dosakis uh, guy, he might be the most interesting man in the Middle East. Um, but. Like I said, he's the most dangerous man in the Middle East, and one of the reasons why is because for a long time, with all of our advanced uh, capabilities, the United States actually thought that this man was dead. We were tracking him, we knew where he was, we knew everything about him, and then all of a sudden he went off the map. Um, I was working at a, we'll call it a well-known think tank here in DC, and I was uh, editing one of the researchers' paper on, on Iran that they were about to send over to Congress to inform congressmen of what's going on in the region. And in there he, he said, uh, Qasim Soleimani died on this day, this time. And I said, where did you get this information? And he cited multiple news agencies, multiple other think tanks, and a couple of different US government agencies. And he said, there, there's my proof, the man is dead. And I said, if he's dead, why haven't they called him a martyr yet? Why haven't they had a funeral for him? Why hasn't the supreme leader um, acknowledged this? Because in Shia culture, a man of his stature, they would call him a martyr. He's, he's um, been a leading member within the Iranian government for a very long time. And why haven't they replaced him? Why, why would they just leave the top position, the top spy for Iran, um, top covert action operator for Iran, why would they leave that position unfilled? And I came to the conclusion that he was not dead. He was alive. And if he was alive, he might still be conducting covert operations. And if he's still conducting covert operations, he's still attacking and killing Americans. And if that is true, we need to find out where he is. It wasn't long, well, it was about a year or so after that um, where he popped up. Not only did he pop up in fashion, he popped up in Baghdad, uh, meeting with al-Maliki. And then he flew to Syria and met with uh, Bashar al-Assad. And now he's considered uh, the most dangerous man in the Middle East. He is running operations throughout the region. Um, and one organization that he has he's developed in order to, to influence Iraq is a group known as Hashid al-Shahabi. Um, for those of you that have been following along, um, when ISIS attacked Iraq, uh, and they were on their drive to, uh, to Baghdad. Grand Ayatollah al-Sistani issued a fatwa, pretty much a call to arms for all Shia to come out and defend not only religious sites, but um, pr protect Baghdad and then counterattack to take back territory. Um, many of these militias were the same militias that were fighting US troops just a couple years earlier such as uh, the Badar organization, Mahadi Army, 
Um, some of these units, units actually were working in the Iraqi government at the time, before they joined uh, the militias, helping to desunify, desunification um, the Iraqi political class, the, the Iraqi bureaucracy, and specifically the Iraqi military. This is actually one of the reasons why I think uh, certain member or certain tribes within or certain Sunni tribes actually joined up with ISIS because they were kicked out of their positions in Iraq and they were being attacked by by the Shia. Um, Hashid al Shabi is actually made up of 40 militias. Um, it's organized. Hashid al Shabi is an umbrella organization um, that then organizes the different militias underneath it. There are between 100,000 to 120,000 men in this, actually and some women, uh, fighting in the militia organizations. Um, the Iranians have made a big deal that this organization is not just Shia, it is also Sunni and Kurds. Um, I've tried to find out you know, where, they, where they were getting that. Uh, I've only found 1%, 1,000 Shia fighters were a member of this organization. And I haven't found any example of, of a single Kurd. Um, I would love it if they would, you know, give me that documentation. You mean Sunni, Sunni fighters? Yeah, Sunni fighters. Um, yeah, only 1% are Sunni fighters. And like I said, it is closely linked to Quds Force and General Qasim Soleimani. Uh, in the recent campaign on Tikrit, two-thirds of, two of the Iraqi forces um, fighting against ISIS, they were actually members of Hashid al-Shahabi. Um, the reason is, according to Iraqi Brigadier General Abed al-Maliki, is that they simply have better weapons and ammunition, they're trained better than us, and they have more support. Now, right here you can see the general conflict going on in Iraq. The red is the Shia areas, black is ISIS, and then up here you have the Kurds. Now, my argument is that this organization, uh, Hashid al-Shahabi, has become the frontline troops for, Iranian, um, for the Iranian offensive. They're closely linked to, to Quds Force and Qasim Soleimani, and they are actually in the war zone. They're fighting ISIS actively, whereas these dots down here are Iraqi regular troops. And now we'll go to the leaders. Who is leading this organization? Um, this man right here, Hadi al-Amiri, is uh, he, for at one point in time in his life, he lived in Iran. He actually fought for the Iranians during the Iran-Iraq War. Uh, right now, he's the leader of the Badar organization, which, is, which was established in 1982 to fight Saddam. Um, the Badar organization also fought the US when we were in Iraq. Um, and is now then entered into the police and military force to do desunification. Now, however, Hadi Al Amiri has used his position with a very strong militia to become the Minister of Transportation. His militia actually was responsible for collecting taxes along the roads. And when the fighting happened, he didn't even have to call anyone up, they were already in, in position. Um, this man right here, Jamal Shafar Mahamid, uh, he is actually better known by his nom de guerre, Abu Mahadi al uh, Mahumdis. He has strong links to Quds Force. He also has strong links to Lebanese uh, Hezbollah, Bar the Badar organization, the Mahadi army, and uh, Khatib Hezbollah. These men, uh, along with Qasim Soleimani, are considered the triangle, the ones that are actually running the military operations in Iraq. They're the ones that are picking the sites. They're the ones that are feeding, clothing, and making sure that the troops on the ground are being taken care of. It is, it is not necessarily the Iraqi government. Um, and all three of these men, one is a ir Iranian general. This man fought for the Iranians during the war. And this man has been trained by Quds Force, and some have even argued that he's actually a Quds Force operative put into Iraq um, to, to fight, are all, they're in charge. And that brings us back to Agent A, 
like I said, we don't actually know what he's thinking. We can only read the signs that he's clearly, or the messages that he's clearly sending to us. This message is that he has a Shia identity. He does not see himself necessarily as Iraqi. He's willing to fight alongside Shia from both uh, Lebanon, being Hezbollah, and from Iran in order to protect himself. He's siding with the Shia against the Sunnis. He believes in Shia Iranian expansionism. He believes in this, he's linked to Iran. Um, but most importantly, he's willing to defend himself, his family, uh, and his community. And that is why I say that he is the foot soldier in Iran's empire. Thank you. All right, I'll be talking about the uh, Syrians of Iraq and cultural identity and conflict. So I'll start with uh, some little ethnography. That death ray go. So this is a picture of northern Iraq, and what we have here in the it's kind of hard to see in the back, perhaps, but the red dots are Christian communities within northern Iraq, and this yellow area here that's your Sunni Arabs, which is primarily where the Islamic State is operating from. A little closer up here, mainly, uh, mainly, most of the Christians are going to be in this orange area here in northern Iraq with a few dotted throughout Kurdistan. Um, now even the orange area is going to have Sunni or Shia tribes, it's very intermixed, intermingled. Um, Pre-2003, Iraq had a Christian Assyrian population of roughly 100,000, uh, oh I'm sorry, 1 million, and they received some protection under Saddam Hussein, but when Saddam Hussein was uh, toppled, after the Americans came in. Um, the Assyrian population was targeted by a lot of religious and sectarian violence, and half that population, roughly 500,000, have since left and joined an international Assyrian diaspora. And that is continuing today. This is a picture of the Islamic State persecuting, or really executing a lot of Christians in Iraq. And really this has been going on since the mid 2000s. It's much been, this has been exacerbated now with uh, the Islamic State and a lack of central power in Iraq. Now I don't just want to talk about what is happening, uh, but I also want to talk about why and the role of culture. And you have a lot of competing cultures here. Um, we've kind of touched on that today. The Islamic State certainly is its own culture, and the Syrian Christians, they're also their own. In America, we have an American political culture, and underneath that we also have subcultures, like you could say there's a sports culture, uh, an academia culture, and with our youth, there's skater culture. And really, I'm more interested in like your, your smaller groups. Um, in Iraq, you have uh, a lot of ethnic and religious groups. It's much more of a diverse country. It's not just Arabs. It's not just Shias. It's not just Sunnis. Um, and here we have uh, some uh, Iraqi Islamic State guys <coughs> posing for the camera. It's a sort of a propaganda picture. It's not exactly a candid camera. Um, but there's some interesting uh, religious symbols here. So you see like a mix of the swords, modern weaponry. Uh, the swords is kind of harkens back to like the early days of Islam when they were first expanding through the sword. A lot of uh, the world view, if you will, of a lot of Islamists, uh, terrorists, insurgents, what have you, who subscribe to uh, the Islamic agenda, they see this war as uh, something that's been going back for thousands of years. You know, Most Americans might see it as something that happened on 9-11, that's when it started. Now it's been, for uh, Islamic State, it's been going on for a very long time. And you can kind of see this guy's holding a Quran. There's a lot of religious undertones throughout this whole conflict. It's uh, not purely political, it's not purely social, it's much more multifaceted. In fact, the culture of the Islamic State is heavily influenced by a religious ideology. And that really drives their actions. And then touching on some definitions here, some culture. And really, culture is just something that forms beliefs. It's got to affect your actions. The things that I believe as a person or that we believe as a country that's going to influence our behavior and what we do. And again, identity. Uh, identity is kind of intertwined in culture in regard to what I'm talking about. And this is pretty straightforward, sense of self, a sense of uh, being and who you are. And then of course conflict, what we really see in northern Iraq is a armed struggle and armed conflict that also has uh, ethnic cleansing, genocide, which is really a holocaust against Christians as well as other ethnic and religious minorities such as Yazidis. Um, touching a little bit briefly on the Syrian culture, they have an ancient heritage, it's very unique, and I'll go into a greater depth there. 
they face literally an existential threat from the expansion, the violent growth of the Islamic State, which, as I mentioned before, is very much ideologically, ideologically motivated. And the Syrians, uh, these two pictures are very deliberate. This one here on the left, this is an ancient artifact. It's called Lamassu. It's just a, a pre-Christian god that's uh, been very prevalent in the ancient Assyrian Empire for 3,000 years. It's a very old culture. The Assyrian Christians today actually consider themselves to be the direct descendants of the ancient Assyrian Empire. Uh, and then here to the right, this is Jesus after he resurrected from the grave. And then on the left, you have Doubting Thomas right here in this blue robe. A lot of Western Christians actually call him Doubting Thomas because we see him as almost a lesser apostle because he didn't really believe that Jesus was like who he was right there. He had to actually inspect the wounds. Well, in Eastern Christianity, which uh, Assyrian Christians, most of them are part of, although you have some Chaldean Catholics, they call him Saint Thomas. He's a huge figure. They actually saw him as like apostle with great faith. And he brought Christianity through the Middle East. The Assyrians were actually um, the first non-Hebrew people to adopt Christianity. So they have a, very, a lot of pride in both their pre-Christian heritage as well as their early Christian heritage. They are among the first people to embrace Christianity. And they are one of Iraq's indigenous, ethnic, and religious groups. They've been around longer than Islam has, and yet the Islamic State considers Assyrians outsiders. And this is uh, the Assyrian flag. They don't actually have a state. Uh, there's been some talk of autonomy or semi-autonomy, much like you have with the Kurdistan regional government. Uh, but it's very probably not going to go anywhere. And you see the Islamic State, driven through culture, maybe a sense of cultural supremacy, literally trying to erase other cultures, among them the Assyrian Christians and other minorities. On here to the left, this is a uh, taken from a video of uh, the Islamic State literally destroying Assyrian artifacts in the museum in Mosul. And then here to the right, that used to be a church. You see an Islamic fighter taking down a cross, replacing it with their signature black flags. Okay. Touching on uh, some of the, the violence, Islamic State, they want to grow. The idea of this Islamic State, they call it the Caliphate. This is a uh, Islamist empire. They believe they're actually literally starting it in territory. And to get people out, they commit ethnic cleansing and genocide. What you have here, this is called the Arabic letter Noon. It's really just the N. Uh, that is a derogatory word for Christian, Nasara, Nazarene is what we call it in English. And their Islamic State is actually going around, I believe this is in Mosul, putting that symbol, the Arabic word for Christian, and on Christian homes and churches to mark who is not a Muslim, essentially. And this is exactly what the Nazis did in Europe against the Jews with the Star of David. And I don't have a lot of pictures on the, the genocide, the beheading, it's very graphic, but as you can imagine, it's ugly. And where the Assyrians are right now, in response to the violence the Islamic State has brought on them, they're trying to protect their culture. They are really the sole preservers of their, their identity. They aren't, they're not getting a lot of help, certainly, from Baghdad, from uh, the Shia militias. They're not getting a lot of help from uh, the Kurds, although there's been some military exchanges and support from the Kurdistan regional government. But within the Middle East, there aren't a lot of resources to protect Assyrian Christians. And they themselves, they literally rely on foreign private donations to equip themselves and arm themselves. And really, uh, this is probably going to happen for like a long time, for years to come. Cultural identity it means a lot to people in the Middle East and other parts of the world. Rather than being allied or owing allegiance to a national identity, what's stronger are things like family ties, uh, religion certainly, even ethnic ties. And Assyrians are both. They're, they have their own religion, Christianity, as well as they're also their own ethnicity. They're not Arab, they're not Kurds. And so because of that, we're going to see competing cultures, competing cultural identities. There's going to be a lot of friction. And we're going to see a lot of ethnic conflict, religious conflict, religious persecution. In a lot of ways, the Assyrians, and among others, are the underdogs. I mean, the Islamic State supposedly receives 1,000 fighters, foreign fighters a day. And the Assyrians are faced with either staying and potentially becoming victims, or they're motivated to just up and leave their native homeland to, to flee. So there you have it.
Some time for questions, certainly. <coughs> Mine is not going to be a question. If I may, I'm going to take the initiative. I want to say how proud I am. Introduce yourself. I'm Owen Smith. I'm the chairman of the board of the Eastern World Office. I want to say how proud I am of this presentation. <coughs> I graduated from college law school lots and lots of years ago, 78 years old. In those days, we faced the Cold War. We faced Russia, the United States, Helmut. We were scared to death. Today, that was simple in comparison to what we're facing in the world today. And these people, these young men and women, our graduates, I understand I have to sign some things out for you. Jason wants me to sign some bubbles. They have put this into perspective. They have done a better job of putting this into perspective than I have seen. I've seen on the TV. You could well be on Fox News tomorrow morning. <laughs> I'll try. I'll talk to Brian. Kill me. Kill me about it tomorrow morning. But you, know, you, you put this in a horrible, horrible situation. The world today is as dangerous as it was when Dr. Lachowski and I graduated from school. But it's certainly a lot. And, but also, it's a lot more complex. And you have taken a, a lot of that and put it in perspective. And you've done it in a manner that I'm very proud to say. That I'm the chairman for this institution. Thank you. 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 Uh, what factor do you believe they're going to play in the future of that region? I'm, there's a factor in mind, but I think the Kurds are going to play a greater impact, a uh, much greater role, especially since we're seeing the international community back them a lot more. Um, they've already gotten semi-autonomy. I think that semi-autonomy is getting stronger. Now, I can't say like if they're going to become like their own country tomorrow or next week or next year, uh, but I do believe that they play an important role already, and I believe that role will also grow. I'm going to put something in there as well. Um, Ty and Ad and I were actually talking about this uh, a while ago. Because of the conflict in Syria, we see the, the Kurdish population um, in Syria is, is starting to move. Um, what we might see, I won't say this is definitely going to happen in the future, but what we might see is that some of them are moving into Iraq. Um, we might see them move back, uh, especially if, if, they, if they gain enough foreign support, they might move back, and then you could see uh, a stronger Kurdish regional government um, in northern Iraq. And if you link that with, with a, a Sunni um, Jazirian government um, just south of there, you could, you could see a counterbalancing act against the Shia in the south of Iraq. I don't know if, if um, I mean, there has to be someone in the government that has thought of that. Because, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's don't assume that. <laughs> uh, it, it, that that could potentially be a possibility. Well, uh, when we were talking about it, um, it, basically the Kurdish region has oil, gas reserves, and everything like that, and the Shia region has a lot of resources as well. And the Jazirin region, um, going across that border, if they were to unite, then they would also have. Um, enough resources at least to have a semi-autonomous region, kind of like the Kurdish regional government right now. So that's what we were Yeah, It would also sort of shrink, the, yeah, shrink the size of the, of the Syrian government's territory, territorial control. Um, should possibly be a goal. Uh, anything else? Jamie, go for it. So you each identified different socio-cultural aspects of the problem to kind of put the problem in context. But can each of you kind of explain a little bit of how your research and the, the sociocultural aspects of the problem can be then used as parts of the solution? All right. We call it, and we don't call it this, so we, it's human terrain. It's 
it's not a 20 year journey, it's been around for quite some time. Um, when the military goes into a country, they're very good at looking at the physical terrain, mountains, rivers, oceans, land, what have you. Um, high terrain, mountains, hilltops, give you an advantage. It's been known for thousands of years in the military. But what often gets ignored is the human terrain, which we kind of equate to social cultural elements. And understanding ethnic groups, religious groups, sub-state actors, their worldview, you need to incorporate that into any form of statecraft, whether that be military or diplomatic. And that's really what we're all about. Uh, I would liken a, a high terrain, physical terrain, uh, to the human terrain as like someone with influence within a culture. It could be a clergy or a local government official or maybe a warlord. Getting them on your side, uh, that's sort of like the equivalent of human terrain to physical terrain. It's using the social cultural elements, human terrain, whatever you want to call it, human factor to your advantage, inter interlacing it with the different elements of statecraft. It's uh, somewhat of a neglected thing that we think. Uh, the military attempted it with human terrain systems, and we're trying to like learn more about that, study anthropology, and apply our lessons here at IWP with some of our independent research. Because we believe that there's a gap between national level, big picture foreign policy, and a lot of things that happen on a small scale. And <coughs> so connecting those things is really what we're trying to do, and that means looking at the big picture and the small picture. So. Mm -hmm. And the human terrain system, just to add a little bit more to that, um, the military had developed the biometric systems where they started um, basically taking facial recognition of people that they came across. And that is just a great technology. So we have the technologies to um, start getting an idea of who these people are that we're interacting with um, in these conflicts. So I think just having that system connect in a strategic level on the bigger picture, um, that's what we hope to contribute to. Um, some more. Uh, so CrossFit says that you have to attack the enemy's center of gravity. Uh, and he says that the center of gravity actually depends uh, or changes based off the enemy. I specifically in my presentation talk about the Iraqi Shia Arab as a center of gravity that we need to know. Um, just like uh, the Sunnis in uh, Jazeera, just like the Assyrian Christians, these are all center of gravities that the US government needs to know and understand. Um, because if you don't, then you, you don't understand the conflict. Uh, another uh, Sun Tzu said uh, know your enemy and know yourself that's that's what a lot of a lot of people remember that line know your enemy and know yourself and, and you'll never be defeated in a hundred battles uh, the first part of that quote is if you don't know your enemy and you don't know yourself you'll never win um, basic logic says if, if you're not going to spend the time to research these centers of gravity uh, don't go to conflict because you're going to lose don't win Taxpayers money. <laughs> um, with respect to the environmental and economic factors, um, one of the reasons I, I had the picture of the uh, Montfrock uh, refugee camp is that um, I spent part of the summer uh, last year in Jordan and I got to see Palestinian refugees. Many of these people have been in Jordan, um, some since 1948, um, some since the 70s, 60s, and some come in from time to time even now. Many of them, uh, uh, to the great, um, I'll put it this way, the Jordanian government granted many of them citizenship. Some ne neglected it, said no, the Palestinian, we're gonna go home. Um, if you put that into perspective, the Jordanian government's been dealing with refugees 60 years, more? Um, yeah, seven, seven plus years. Um, they don't wanna keep dealing with that, obviously. It's a huge strain on their Economy, it's a huge strain on their environment. They don't have enough water to supply their own food. It's the fourth most water scarce country in the world. Um, I'm highlighting Jordan because I know it a little bit better. Um, Iraq faces many of the same issues. Uh, it's even more complex there because the rule of law is sketchy. Um, they pointed out how um, the actual formalized military in Iraq is not even allowed to take on ISIS. They're not. It's being controlled by Iran. Um, and then Iraqi uh, military people um, that are loyal to Iraq. Um, people in the refugee camps are sinning for the most part. 
people fighting ISIS on the ground for the most part the Shia. So it's going to be a mess. It's going to be a very long war. We think um, it, it could end up looking like Lebanon um, in Syria. One of the key issues with that is people don't have homes to go to. So if you're stuck in a refugee camp, they're going to get fed up with it really, really quick. Um, they're not pretty. They're not nice. They're not comfortable. It's hot. It's cold. Um, there's even little stories that I've read of, of wedding parties being taken, taking place in villages along the refugee camp of Jordanian families, and they're celebrating and they're shooting off rifles, which is very common uh, in the countryside in Jordan, and scaring people inside the refugee camp because where they came from, there was guns and bullets and bombs. Um, so this creates sort of a continued perfect storm, um, lack of opportunity, um, high propensity for future conflict that is not taken care of. And it doesn't matter how good refugee camps are run, these people want to go home, they value their independence, um, but they may not have a home to go to. So it, it's a huge, huge problem. It doesn't matter what na America's national security position is, it's going to affect us. We're going to have to come up with some sort of contingency plan to deal with it. It's not just about dealing with ISIS. If the conflict ends tomorrow, we've got a heck of a mess to deal with. Uh, and I don't really think anybody's got any good answers to fix it. Um, so, um, as, as the chairman said, it's a very complex issue. Um, and it's something that really, really needs to be looked at very seriously. Um, <coughs> what we talked about, um, what Mr. Maxwell talked about, the Ron Zay defense system is also very important. Um, but it's a, this whole picture is very, very complex. It's hard to derive who the actors are who's leading this um, at different times. Um, like, like Nick mentioned, we thought Iran's uh, intelligence uh, top leader was dead. Why? We should have known that. We didn't. Um, we should be very clear about who's leading what. Um, who's the Iraqi government we hold into? Are they independent? Are they loyal to us? Are they loyal to Iran? Um, these all affect the refugees as well. And um, so we, we, this is an attempt on our part. Oh, what's sort of religious orthodoxy, if any, are the Iranians trying to get? the Shia Iraqis to follow? Is, is that part of their empire building So what, what I understand, are you asking me if, if they're trying to kind of recruit them into over Shiaism? Are, are they trying to make uh, Iraqi Shias live the way that Iranian Shias live in Iran? So the the Iraqi Shia, are, for the most part, are already 12 or, uh, 12 or Shia, which means that they believe that the 12th Imam is the Mahdi, and he will return. Uh, and once he returns, paradise will be established, and everything will be okay. Um, now, well my, well, my thesis is that they want to first establish the Shah and Shah, which is a concept of, for those of you that are fans of Godfather, you'd probably recognize it better as Capo di Tutti Capi. It means boss of bosses. First, they want to establish their authority their legitimate authority over um, the area. And then after that has been established, then they want to um, spread the revolution, which they've been trying to spread since 79. Um, what we have seen on the ground in Baghdad, uh, and actually we also saw this in Lebanon, is that they use local actors, bring them back to Iraq, train them in ideological warfare, and then send them back home. Um, and then, so it's not actually Iranian <coughs> personnel that are, that are pushing <coughs> the ideology. It's, it's the locals. Um, like I said, well, the, the pictures aren't up anymore. Um, but uh, Hadi Al-Amiri, he's, he's an Iraqi, but, um, and he was a follower of Al-Sistani's quietism. Now, however, he believes in the Supreme Leader's clerical jurisprudence. Um, so it's, Am I, am I answering your, your question correctly? Right, because I mean, it shows that they're taking a more subtle approach. Yeah, they're not doing it directly. Yeah. Yeah, they're not, the Iranians are not going around um, uh, smashing uh, smashing icons and throwing crosses on the ground. No, they're not doing because uh, they recognize that that's how you lose enemies, or lose friends quickly in the region, and you make enemies. Um, because not all, 100,000 of those uh, Iraqi Shia 
not all of them support Iranian expansion. What they support is defending themselves from being eliminated by ISIS. And they're willing to fight to do that. Um, but there are agents within those militia units, within those camps, that are slowly working away. Any other questions? Okay. In the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got a question, general question about Sharia law. Now, I think Iran is an Islamic state, presumably under Sharia law, and I believe he said that in ISIS-controlled areas, they have courts which I presume is Sharia law. And I, I think there the, the ISIS tends to be more Sunni as opposed to Shia. But, but I'm, I'm wondering as far as Sharia, Sharia law is concerned, how much, uh, ha, have you looked into how much of it is traditional from the Quran, the Hadith, and then legal scholars and that sort of thing? And how much is it a, a pragmatic thing that a, a, a ruler of a nation or a particular group would apply Sharia law in, in a particularly customized way uh, within this particular domain? So um, when we talk about that, we first have to distinguish between are they Sunni or are they Shia? Um, now Shia, the, the clergy has a more active, um, they can actively interpret it um, how, they, how they wish. In fact, in, in Shia, in Iran, you can, get, you can get married on one day um, and then get divorced on the next. And, and the reason is because you, you wanted to have sex. That's legal. And Sunnism, I don't believe so. Um, uh, so in, in, within Shiaism, there, you, yeah, so first you have to distinguish between the two, and then it's up to the local imam in, in Shiaism to how they, they interpret it. In regard to the Islamic State, it's definitely Sunni. And from what I've researched, it's Salafi, which is basically saying that it's uh, fundamental, very medieval in nature. It goes back to like how Muhammad did it and his early followers within the first 150, 200 years. Um, so very barbaric, low tech, if you will. But it's also pragmatic. Um, I'd say it's both. They see a lot of utility in this, and there certainly is you know, Sharia courts and a Sharia uh, criminal justice system in ISIS-controlled territories and towns. Um, in Jordan, um, citizens have the option to use Sharia courts for courts based on more of a Western legal standpoint that they got from the church when uh, Trans Jordan was set up in the way of World War I. Um, uh, it, it, it's interesting that they provide that option, but they wouldn't provide it if the locals didn't want it. So that's why it's an option, it's not mandated. Um, so there will certainly be those under ISIS who appreciate that uh, and, and wish to adhere to it. Um, I know in the very early stages of ISIS's formation of courts um, and other public services, they actually had a call on social media for Islamic uh, judges from places such as Saudi Arabia to come in um, and be part of their, um, their movement. Um, they needed legal experts in Islamic law. Um, I guess, I can't say how many people under the um, control of ISIS really want that, um, but it certainly is there, and um, it does sort of lessen the chaos that many of these people might have been living under um, if they got to flee into ISIS territory, or if they were in fact opposed to the government and they see ISIS as a lesser people. Symposium. These are just five of the Institute's students, and as you can tell, we learn a lot of different things here, and the skills we learn, we have just applied to one region. Uh, there are students who study all of the other regions of the world. So if you're interested in the topics that David or our panel have discussed today, their full reports will be available online through our academic journal and you can find those at the IWP website, which is iwp.edu. So those will be published shortly. If this is your first time at the Institute. We hope to see you again soon for another event. And if you've been here before or part of our IWP family, welcome back. Um, if you don't have any questions for me, I will release you for the evening. 
And so on behalf of Student Ambassadors and our academic journal and the President's Office, we thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you.